Well, thank you very much, and thanks everyone. Hopefully everyone's having a good afternoon. Uh, as Keith mentioned, my name is Lindsay. I'm a recent graduate of USC's GIST master's program, and I gotta extend my thanks to my advisor, Dr. Karen Kemp. Uh, without her, this would have been impossible. And as the title explains, it's a mouthful, but in a nutshell, what I was interested in looking at is the water in the middle of the water column and the physical properties associated with that. And not just looking at those properties, but looking at change over time. So a little bit about the data. Uh, the data comes from a research group called CalCoffee, and they include their uh, water column properties in with the, the term hydrographic data. They've been doing oceanographic surveys for 70 years. This year is their 70th anniversary. Uh, weather and uh, boat availability allowing. They go out four times a year, once per season. And the research vessel transits these six transects that you can see here. Along the way, it stops at each of the sampling stations, which is not a physical station, but a set of coordinates. And at each of those sampling stations, the vessel drops down a CTD, which is equipped with quite a few sensors to pick up important to this project temperature and a bunch of other attributes. And it's also equipped with several bottles to capture seawater samples that can then be analyzed on board for nutrients and things like that. And this project is near and dear to my heart, in part because it's off the coast of California where I grew up, ranging from San Diego to just north of Point Conception, and also because I was a volunteer intern for these guys back in 2012. So that's me on board the ship, very excited about taking water samples. So the area that CalCoffee surveys is referred to as the California Current System, or CCS. I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir here when I say this is a valuable region. It's one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. It's an eastern boundary current with lots of upwelling. Uh, so that means a very productive ecosystem. It's also home to economically important fisheries, as well as economically important tourism. As I said, this is off the coast of California, so this area is utilized by a lot of the locals, as well as a lot of visitors, and enjoyed by a lot of these people as well. Finally, this area has been shown to be a carbon sink, at least in some regions. So that is also an important contributor uh, to the state of our climate. So there's a chain of cause and effect that affects the productivity in this region. And this has been the understanding for several decades. At the top, we have the phytoplankton, which we've talked about several times over the past couple of days. They're the primary producers. They use the sun to perform photosynthesis. And that's where the energy that fuels the whole ecosystem and all the fisheries comes from. The phytoplankton live in the top 100 meters or so of the water, give or take. Uh, and they are limited by the availability of the nutrient nitrate in this region. So nitrate is a macronutrient. It's essential for the phytoplankton to do their thing. And nitrate has a spatial pattern as well, that, which is important. And the nitrate is very abundant in the deep layer, uh, down below 200 or so meters. And it's relatively rare up at the surface layer because it gets utilized really quickly by the phytoplankton. So the availability of nitrate limits the phytoplankton, and the movement of nitrate is what determines how much reaches the surface where the phytoplankton can use it. Now, there's a structure that controls the movement of that phyto, uh, the nitrate to the phytoplankton, and that would be the thermocline. So the water at the surface is warm, relatively low density. Deeper down, it's cold, high-density water, and the thermocline is the region of change in between. The thermocline acts as a barrier to movement between those layers because the two different density groups of water don't like to mix. And the greater the difference in temperature between the surface and the deeper water, the stronger the thermocline and the less mixing there is. So the temperature of the water is a really important attribute as well. So understanding for several years has been that if sea surface temperature increases, which it has been shown to be doing, that should limit the nitrate and reduce the productivity in this region. Uh, but there's been quite a few different papers that have come out that have shown that the productivity has not reduced as much as we expected looking at satellite data and also in situ measurements. So that kind of 
leaves a mystery as to why this is happening, and it suggests that something a little bit more complicated is going on. So that's what I wanted to investigate. My research goals were to determine the spatial and temporal changes in temperature. I wanted to make sure that I was detecting the, the increase in surface temperature that's been noticed by other researchers. And then I wanted to find out what was going on with the nitrate, what sort of changes we're seeing in that important nutrient in the California current system. Now, like I said, this is data that's in the mid-water column, so by nature, it's three-dimensional. Every point has latitude and longitude and depth as well. And when we look at change over time, that's adding a fourth dimension as well. So to look at this and answer these questions in the way that I wanted to, I had to create a bit of a new workflow. So here's the overview of the methods. Step one, same as any project, you download and prepare the data, get rid of the uh, excess parts that I didn't need, such as notes about weather, and plot it as points in Arc Pro. The next step was we have several surveys to compare. Over the time period I looked at, which was about 50 years, there were 181 surveys that were taken. So, it's a little tricky to compare these surveys side by side without first interpolating them to comparable prediction volumes first. So, conveniently for me, Esri came out with empirical Bayesian Krieging 3D just in time for me to do my master's thesis, so thanks for that, and it proved really useful. Once I had that result, uh, it's still a lot to look at, so to analyze and look at change over time, I needed to slice the data into cross-sections. I did both horizontal and vertical cross-sections, and doing that allowed me to input those cross-sections into the space-time cube tool to look at change over time, and the tool I chose to do that was the Mann-Kendall statistic. So to walk through, this is the raw data. This is temperature data. You can see the warmer temperatures are in yellow at the surface, colder temperatures are in dark purple at the bottom. The green points are the Cal Coffee sampling stations, and you can see the, the measurements cluster around those points, but they're not always spot on. I can't blame them, they're on a ship moving around in wind and weather, and at the beginning of these surveys, they didn't have GPS on board the ships. So, the problem is, we need to compare these samples from survey A to these samples in survey B. You can see they're oftentimes in slightly different spatial locations. Uh, so that's where empirical Bayesian Krieging 3D came in handy to standardize the, the predictions. So, here are some sample results from EBK 3D, this is two surveys out of the 181. You can look at them side by side. The results of this interpolation tool are a 3D prediction volume. So 2D interpolation gives you a surface, 3D interpolation gives you this volume. And you can see it's scrolling through horizontal cross sections within that volume, showing nitrate in this case. So blue is low nitrate at the surface. Going down to high nitrate is red down at the bottom which is 500 meters down. Now, you can imagine comparing two side by side is kind of a lot to process, and if you have 181 of these, uh, it's just too much to take in at once. So the next step is to slice these up into cross sections. So slicing the results of EBK 3D into horizontal cross sections is pretty straightforward. I chose six cross sections at 0, 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500 meters below the surface. And the tool has an option just to export those cross sections, so that's what I did. And during this process, it was important to sort out each cross section into its own folder. So, for example, I made a 100 meter folder, and that's where I aggregated all the results for all the 100 meter slices of all the 181 surveys. And what that meant is once I had all my 100-meter slices in, in one folder, I had the, the correct input data for the space-time cube. That needs to have an X and a Y coordinate for location, and then time stacks up along the Z-axis for that space-time cube. Now, this is important because it proved problematic when I wanted to make vertical cross-sections. Uh, nonetheless, I thought it was important to make vertical cross-sections because the arrangement of the layers and the motion vertically in the water column is important to this question. So, I chose to make my vertical slices along the original six Cal Coffee transects. That's where the interpolation predictions were most accurate. 
There's not exactly a tool to do that, uh, but you can export the results to points. So I made vertical planes of points to export my interpolation results to. And the next step was I needed to get those planes to lay down horizontally to use uh, the space-time queue. So I actually took my vertical slices, moved them over to a different scene and a different coordinate system, laid them down flat, if you will, and then I could input them into the space-time cube tool with x and y data as the location and time on the z-axis. Uh, so then I could use the, the space-time cube to run my analysis, but I will say it's important to remember to stand that layer back up to represent a vertical cross-section once again at the end. So here are some results. In the top, you can see this is a horizontal cross-section. It's temperature at the surface at zero meters. It's kind of a familiar layout to anyone who's used a space-time cube. I've got an inset there. You can see the more recent predictions, recent time slices are in the little hexagonal bins in the inset, and the recent ones are at the top. Darker purple, that means it's more warm recently uh, than it was in the past, lighter purple. On the bottom, I've got the space-time cube for a vertical slice. So this is where folks that have used the space-time cube start looking at me sideways. Uh, but it's the same deal. In this case, if you look at the inset, the older or further in the past predictions are on the left, and the more recent ones are on the right in each of those little hexagonal bins. And the same analysis applies. There aren't exactly graphics for this in Arc Pro, so you can see I, I did my best. So here are the results. It's a little difficult still to just look at a space-time cube and see what the trends are. And so fortunately, there's a variety of statistics to use to understand that. I chose to use the Mann-Kendall statistic, which just simply shows monotonic trends. So a simple increase, decrease, or no significant trend. And I chose a significance level of, of 95% confidence. So along the bottom here, you can see a film strip, if you will, of the different layers of that space-time cube changing over time. And then the larger image is the trends that are shown by the Mann-Kendall statistic. Now, I wound up with a dozen of these. I had a dozen horizontal cross-sections, six for temperature, six for nitrate. This is the most interesting one. So I just wanted to show you, this is the temperature at the surface. You can see there's an area of significant increase in the offshore region in particular. So that answers the first question. Uh, the temperature is indeed increasing at the surface. I also thought it was interesting, it does not appear to be increasing significantly based on this data closer to the coast. And I think that's possibly because that's a region where there's a lot of change and a lot of upwelling happening all the time. Next, I have a vertical cross section. And similarly, there were a dozen of these. This is the most interesting. So similar, a film strip along the side shows change in the space-time cube. And to orient, the top of this is the surface of the water. The bottom is 500 meters down. California is on one side, and uh, offshore is on the other, on the left side there. So this results are fairly interesting. You can see at the surface, offshore, that blue region indicates a decrease in nitrate. But below there, the large area red indicates an area in the deep water where nitrate is increasing. Now, this trend holds true through several other cross-sections as well. This is kind of a conceptual representation of those vertical slices taken underneath each of the original Cal Coffee transects, just to make sure everyone's oriented. It is a little busy, uh, so I came up with this view. This is the, the six vertical slices showing nitrate, made semi-transparent and overlaid, so you can kind of have a, a fish's eye view of what's going on here. Looking through those, those six transects, you can see that area of nitrate decrease at the surface is consistent in several of the transects. And the area of nitrate increase also is a consistent core through several slices. Now, this suggests some interesting trends. It looks like, in the offshore region, the, the trend that was expected is kind of taking place here. So there's not nitrate reaching the surface, and that's the same area that we saw an increase in temperature. So that suggests that there's a strengthened thermocline 
which is preventing the nitrate from reaching the surface, that would suggest that this would be a region of low productivity. On the other side, it looks like there's a different story. As we can see in the deep layer, there are increased amounts of nitrate. Upwelling has continued, and some recent papers actually suggest that upwelling may be increasing in some regions. Uh, so if nitrate is increasing and it's continuing to move to the surface, that means we're actually getting more nitrate at the surface in the areas closer to the coast, which might mean that that's a region of high productivity. Now, these results allow us to perhaps make some predictions or gain a better understanding of the ecosystem. From here, it's speculation and further tests would further prove this. But if these trends continued, it might mean that we're headed towards a regime of greater extremes with something like a nutrient desert in the offshore region and something like nutrient oases that are very productive closer to the coast. So, like many research questions, answering that one oftentimes leads to another question, which is, where did all that nitrate come from? And I don't know for sure, but my best guess is that this increased nitrate is a global effect, not a local effect. So the area where the nitrate is increasing lines up with past research that shows where the core of the California current is. And this is a current that comes down the west coast from British Columbia, and so changes in the circulation of the Pacific, in the nutrient load that that current is bringing down from the North Pacific, are perhaps causing the changes that we're seeing down here in our little corner of the California current system. So this would be a great area for future research. I think I heard it earlier today that current data is few and far between sometimes. Uh, I also know that ESRI and the EMUs have some current data, so perhaps that would be a, a useful link for future steps. But it's clear that there, there is more to be done in this field. So with this new information, we can perhaps draw some better conclusions. It seems clear that this original framework uh, has some other factors that are playing in, and a lot of them tie to the global climate. So the climate, of course, drives the temperature. That would be uh, controlling the surface temperature, which drives this trend, but also the climate is going to control uh, the winds that drive the upwelling, and stronger winds might create more upwelling. Uh, it's also responsible for the circulation of the currents in the Pacific, and so getting a good understanding of the dynamics in this region might allow us to do better modeling and better forecasting of this region. That might, in turn, allow us to manage our marine protected areas and create new marine protected areas in places that are potentially going to be hotspots of productivity. And last but not least, of course, it would inform our fisheries management. If we want to ensure that we've got strong fisheries in the future, it might be wise to pay attention to where the nutrients and where the productivity is going to be at. So to conclude, my research and this data set just occupies one little corner of the Pacific. But I hope that this workflow and this data might suggest further research and help other researchers in learning more about the world's oceans. Thank you. Thank you.